This episode contains mature language and situations. Listener discretion is advised. You wake, standing on the doorstep of a beautiful mansion. The front door stands open. You can hear voices, music, so many, many people. You step towards the door. You have to know what's inside. You're lost. You have no memory of how you got here. It doesn't matter. Because now, you belong to... The Grey Rooms. The Logs of Admiral Beckett, Part 1 Chapter 1 Welcome to Ash Manor What are we? What makes us, us? Philosophers debate what I see as a very simple question. We are the choices we make. We'll be there soon, sir. Just sit back and let old Todd get you where you need to go. I didn't answer. I had no idea who the old man was or where I was going. I had no real memory beyond awakening to the gentle swaying of the carriage. Other men would have been afraid. I was not. Beyond the window rolled fields of golden wheat and purple lilacs. Their heady scent wafted through the fading sunlight and filled the cabin with countryside smells. I crossed my arms the shoulders of my well-tailored uniform tightening comfortably around me. I was calm. I didn't know why I was there, but I knew what kind of man I was. I trusted my choices. I knew that. And my name. My name was Beckett. We crested a hill and I saw it. The cobbled pathway led right up to the manor's front entrance. It was a massive, sprawling thing. 
Everywhere your eyes cared to look, there were eaves and gables, great sweeping window panes that glowered down on expansive grounds. Gardens stretched off around the side of the house. I could see a wooded thicket, a graveyard, a pond. The estate just seemed to stretch on and on off to the horizon. We crossed the distance to the house, and the carriage slowed to a stop. The driver hopped down from his perch, pretty spry for an old man, and pulled open the door with his one good hand. Todd stood in the open doorway, beaming up at me. He wore a well-tailored, modern suit. A groomed beard and mustache dominated his sallow face, and gray hair hid beneath a black newsy cap. His left hand rested on the door to the carriage, while his right hung awkwardly at his side. It was a prosthetic, made of obsidian stone carved with intricate runes. Thank you. Todd, was it? Yes, sir. That's what they call me. <laughs> I'm the driver, a groundskeeper, bit of a jack of all trades round here. Beckett. Oh, yes, sir. I know. I looked up at the imposing front of the manor, still unafraid. The shadows now loomed large across the landscape as the sun began to set. If you know who I am, then do you know why I'm here? Because I... Uh, I apparently don't. Uh, yes, sir. I had a feeling that might be so. Come this way, we can get you all sorted out. I looked back at the carriage as he led me away. The horses looked wrong somehow, but in a way I couldn't place, like shadows stripped from their manes. I strode across the gravel drive and he led me up the short set of stairs to the front porch. He raised his right hand, black stone, and rapped twice on the massive oak door. After a brief pause, the door swung wide, revealing a grand foyer, a sweeping staircase leading up to the second floor, and a man in a great black coat. His wild hair fell around his face in long curls, and his burning eyes stared as if they could see into my very core. His mouth was curled back into an expansive grin, and he winked like we were sharing a secret. I thought at first he might be a prankster, but I looked again and sought for what it was. Madness. Welcome to Ash Manor, Mr. Beckett. Welcome to the Grey Rooms. Sir, this here is the warden. Uh, a games warden from Manor. Uh, keeps us fed and on our toes. Yes, yes, he surely does. I extended a hand to the man, but he just stood there, staring. I glanced at Todd, who merely shrugged. I let my arm drop. Good to meet you, warden. Todd here says you might be able to explain why I'm here. Oh, yes. We expect big things from you. The warden turned that unsettling gaze on Todd, who visibly winced. See to the horses, won't you, Todd? We'll speak later. Yes, sir, right, right away. Oh, good luck, Mr. Beggett. Oh, don't worry, it gets easier as you go. <laughs> As Todd walked away into the gathering darkness, the warden moved aside. Instinctively, I stepped inside the manor, glancing back over my shoulder. 
It might have been my imagination, but I thought I saw one of the horses staring after me. Its eyes were ablaze with the light of the setting sun. The heavy door swung closed, sealing me in. The floors were marble, the stairs a richly polished mahogany, and above us, a chandelier danced with light. Through the doorways on either side, I could see what looked like a dining hall and a parlor. It's so good to see you. Finally here. Please, follow me. I followed. The strange man led me through the parlor, past a swinging servant's door into a long hallway. Within moments, I lost all sense of direction. The passage that I thought led to the back of the house split into three lengthy corridors. The turn we took there should have brought us right back to the front of the house where we started. Instead, we stepped onto a small balcony at the midpoint of a circular staircase. We ascended the steps into a tower that I hadn't seen from the manor's exterior. Other men would have been afraid. I was merely curious. Interesting place you have here, Warden. The manor helps us to do our work. Ever changing, ever watching. Always surprising. We stepped out into a hallway on the upper story and stopped. A banister ran the length of the hallway. The banister in turn separated the walkway from a large ballroom. The ceiling above the ballroom was made of glass panels, which let in the light of an impossible sky. Impressive, isn't it? Beyond the glass, great fluffy white clouds swirled against a backdrop of greenish gray, and out at the edge of my vision, I could see what looked like steel superstructures hanging in orbit. Below us, the lacquer flooring of the ballroom shone with polish as a few dozen people walked and danced and spoke amongst themselves. Candles flickered in holders as staff filled flutes with dark red wine. None of this should have been possible. None of it could have fit into the building I entered only moments ago. How is this possible? Management has created the Grey Rooms for a very special purpose, Mr. Beckett. You are central to this plan. Everything here is for you. You're special. So very, very special. Special? How? Why am I here? Instead of answering me, he turned out towards the crowd. Everyone! Everyone! Your attention, please! <sighs> hey! Listen up, or I'll gut you where you stand! <clears throat> Thank you, and good evening, management, contributors to the project, investors and guests. May I present Mr. Beckett. I looked down at the audience, a sea of people wearing every kind of tailored suit and flowing dress and elaborate costume, all of them wearing featureless white masks. The masks completely covered their faces, and their eye holes were shadowed, opaque. Dozens of faceless mannequins applauded my arrival at a place I didn't understand, and for a purpose I didn't yet know. Mr. Beckett has newly arrived to the manor and has yet to enter his first room. With approval from management, I will escort him there now. 
As one, every ghostly face turned towards the figure in the center of the room. He was a huge barrel-chested man with an impeccable coal-black suit. Across his chest, he wore a crimson sash, bloody in the flickering candlelight of the ballroom. Slowly, with predatory steps, he stalked forward. Every eye in the room was fixed upon him. I couldn't see behind the mask, but I could feel his gaze as if stones were pressing against my chest. My nerve did not give way, I'm pleased to report. I stared right back at him. A long moment passed. A sort of potent tension hung in the air, as if the manner itself was awaiting his response. I felt the hairs on my arms stand up. I felt something I was sure I'd never felt before. But then, almost imperceptibly, he nodded. He turned on his heel and walked back towards the guest he'd left behind. Management is pleased. Wish Mr. Beckett luck, everyone. The guests seemed to have forgotten we were there, as no response came, nor did the warden await one. He turned and began to walk down the hallway, his hand trailing along the banister as he did. On our right, as he walked, were doors, row after row of doors. Every door we passed was strange somehow, out of place. One old and industrial, rusting, another like a farmhouse door. A boring gray apartment block door sat right behind a bright red emergency door, with huge claw marks carved into its surface. Near the end of the hall we stopped. The warden turned to look at me, those mad eyes staring deep into mine. I stared back, refusing to be intimidated. During your time here, you will be allowed the chance to relax, to enjoy what the manor has to offer. As you can see, it is a fine and beautiful place. He gestured out into the ballroom. But ultimately, the reason you're here, your purpose, you have to make a choice. We are the choices we make. Here, we have a door. It leads to a room. Every room tells a story, don't you think, Mr. Beckett? I nodded, confused. The door he was gesturing to looked like any ordinary gray door you might find in a single-family suburban home. This room's story is one of tragedy and loss. Of a woman marking the loss of her mother and seeking a better tomorrow. He gestured again to the door beside it. This door looked very out of place in the fine manor hallway. It was an airlock like one you'd see fitted to the exterior of a space station. This room's tale is also one of sorrow. In the quest for knowledge, a group of explorers pushes the limits of the human experience, and the limits push back. At the back of my mind, I noted the archaic designs of the seal fitting marked it as circa 2300, a design from the long-abandoned soul system. I shook my head, tried to focus. Choose. I'm sorry, what am I choosing? Choose a door and step through. Why? Because if you don't, I'll kill you. I knew he would do it. I could see it in his eyes. Other men would have been afraid. There's no need for violence, Warden. I'm simply asking why I've been brought here to do this. Why do I need to choose a door? It seems like a reasonable question. His eyes bulged from his head. 
I could see his hands clench, tense. Flecks of spittle appeared at the corner of his mouth. I still wasn't afraid, but I took a step back. I told myself it was to gain a tactical advantage if he were to attack me, but he didn't. The feud passed, quickly as it had come. He shook his head. <clears throat> it, it is, it is a reasonable question, but not one I should answer. There are other people that work here at the manor. If you choose a room and go inside, I'll send someone to talk to you. They can explain. How does that sound? I nodded. Thank you, Warden. I hope you appreciate the strange circumstances I find myself in. I caught the flicker of a smile. There and gone from his face like a passing shadow. I do. I do appreciate it. Now, which will it be? I stepped closer, examining the doors. I could see that both had brass plates set to the side, where you'd see the room numbers at a high-end hotel. These, though, had merely words etched into metal. The apartment doors read, The Last Word. The airlocks read, Venus Flytrap. I turned back to the warden. Venus Flytrap. The airlock. Decisive. Gestured. I like I it. I stepped toward the airlock door. At my approach, it opened. I almost smiled at the antique sound of an old-style airlock cycling. Within, I could see a cruise lounge like you'd see on one of those older model stations. White carbon filter walls, gray furniture with everything bolted to the deck plates. There was another airlock door on the far wall. I stepped inside, looking around. There was no one else there. I turned back towards my host, who stood on the far side of the doorway. Should I just wait? then, or... Yes, Mr. Beckett. Now that you've made your choice, just wait. I'll see you again very soon. The door sealed closed. The last I saw of him as it shut was his grim smile. For a long moment, I just stood there. Other than being a bit dusty, the air a bit dry, the room seemed unremarkable. I noticed there was a porthole in the far wall and strode towards it. Beyond the porthole was the vast, black emptiness of space. It was comforting, I realized, but not why. I had no context for why this vast, inky ocean made me feel at home. I noticed a sound then, in the quiet of the lounge, a strange, foreboding sensation that traveled up my spine. I turned back into the room looking for its source. There was nothing there. But there, around the edges of the airlock on the far wall, I could see a light, unsteady, flickering as if someone was shining a flashlight into the cracks. The noise was louder, and I realized it was coming from the far side of the door. Hello? I called out. No response beyond the noise itself. I knew it in my heart. It was not other men. Hello? Who? 
Who's there? I started as I heard my own voice. The strange location, the noise, the crowd, the warden. It had all caught up to me. Answer me, damn you. Who's there? I was not like other men. I would not give in to fear. The door opened. And then, just like any other man, I was afraid. Chapter 2 The New Attendant I woke to the sound of rain. I opened my eyes just a slit, wincing at even the dim light in the room. I had a pounding headache. I was laid out on a couch in a room decked out in green brocade, thick carpets and antique silver. Droplets pattered against the window panes. For a moment, I was calm, at peace. Then I remembered. Ah! My eyes snapped open in horror. Ah! The rotten egg smell. Blood in my mouth. The cat. Ah! 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 I leapt off the couch, staggering about the room. I grasped for a side table to steady myself. Another gap in my memory. I couldn't remember how I'd gotten here. I had been in the room, after the warden had closed the outer door, the inner door had opened, and then... I told myself I was not like other men, that I was not afraid, but I stood in that dark room struggling to breathe. I died. I remembered it. My face was not my own. I had lived another life. It wasn't me. I was that man, John. It was all I could do to put one foot in front of the other. It was all I could do to draw breath. My eyes darted from shadow to shadow, thinking I'd see those eyes again. Those cat eyes, glowing in the darkness. I couldn't stop myself. I opened my mouth to scream. Ah, there you are. Good afternoon. The sudden burst of light startled me, and I blinked furiously, swallowing my fear. I looked towards the door, squinting. A tall, thin woman stood in the now open doorway. Her hair was hickory-colored pulled tight into a bun atop her head. Her skin was the color of autumn leaves, and two bright eyes peered at me from behind round, rimless spectacles. She wore a dark suit, antiquarian, and my first thought was that she would have looked at home in the smoking room of a Victorian billiards club. The chain of a pocket watch was clipped to a button on her vest trailing down to disappear beneath her coat. I'm sorry to have startled you. Are you all right? I... <clears throat> I'm fine. 
I've just had a very disturbing experience, and I have a bit of a headache, I'm afraid. Your first room. I would imagine it would be quite distressing. She crossed the room with precise strides to stand before me. She extended a hand, and I took it. My name is Alma, Mr. Beckett. I'm an attendant here at Ash Manor. It's a pleasure to meet you in person. Her skin was warm. Her handshake firm. Despite the pain, I found myself instantly liking her. She reminded me of someone, though I couldn't think who. I had to stop myself from smiling as my hand fell away. Yes, ma'am. The pleasure is all mine. Alma. Don't call me ma'am, and I won't call you sir. Yes, ma'am. Alma. I'm sure you have a number of questions, Mr. Beckett. While I can't answer all of them, I can hopefully make you a bit more comfortable with the trials before you. And I can serve you tea. I blinked. Tea? I have a lovely blend of lavender and peppermint that should help. Or Earl Grey if you'd prefer some caffeine. Tea. Tea would be nice. Thank you. Lead the way. She led me down a hallway lit with gas lamps and beautiful wood flooring. I glanced out the window to orient myself and caught a glimpse of the woods in a sudden flash of lightning. We were on the north side of the manor, for all that mattered. We stepped through the door at the end of the hall and I found myself walking through a large glass-walled conservatory. As rain pelted down outside, little songbirds flitted through the trees overhead. Torches marked the edges of a gravel path that wound its way into the darkness. Alma led the way through the grove. I could smell orange blossoms and passion flowers, vine stalkers and orchid flutes, and a dozen other plants I couldn't identify. Alma, are you a part of... I think the warden called them management. Oh my, no. I'm just on staff here. I'm new, but finding my way. As I said, my title is attendant. I'm here to help you acclimate. She looked over her shoulder at me, trying to give me a reassuring smile. We want you to be comfortable when you're in the manor, after all. Ah. Good. Yes. <clears throat> The Warden wouldn't tell me why I'm here. He'll be no help with answers, I'm afraid. The Warden can be a challenging person to talk to. One of the other attendants likes to call him Mercurial. I just think he's crazy. We left the birds and the trees behind yet another door and the shadows of a lengthy corridor surrounded us. It was lined with portraits of all shapes and sizes. I tried not to look into their eyes, tried not to entertain the thought that they were watching us as we passed door after door. Just as in the hallway upstairs, each door seemed very out of place. A barn gate stood beside a glass pull door with a coffee cup logo etched into the front. The sliding entry to a grocery store stood mere inches from what was obviously a child's bedroom. I'm sure you've already seen how strange the manor's layout can be, Mr. Beckett. Please try not to wander without a guide. We don't want you getting into any trouble while you're under our roof. She turned toward me with another smile and pushed open a door on the left. 
The well-dressed attendant gestured grandly for me to precede her. I stepped out into a screened-in porch somewhere on the back of the house. Fresh air and the smell of rain were a balm on my nerves after walking the strange and twisting halls of the manor. A dim afternoon sun shone through the clouds. Part of our view was obscured by what looked like a hedge maze, one I'm quite sure I hadn't seen on my way in with Todd. A fire crackled in the stone hearth set into the porch's wall, driving away any chill. A kettle whistled merrily from a hook over the blaze. Take a seat just there, Mr. Beckett. I'll get our tea ready. She pointed to a pair of wicker chairs facing each other over a glass-topped table. Both were positioned such that we could look out onto the grounds. I settled into the one with an overstuffed blue pillow. Grateful for a moment to relax. Sitting here, smelling the rain and awaiting my tea, the death and terror of that space station seemed very far away. Go on then, ask your questions. We're never going to have as much time as we'd like to chat, but I'll tell you what I can. I raised an eyebrow. You people certainly do like your cryptic statements. All I'm looking for is some clarity. I promise you, Mr. Beckett, when I'm on duty, I'll do all that I can to make you comfortable. She came to the table carrying a tray loaded down with madelines and finger sandwiches, small bowls filled with fruits and nuts. The center of the tray was dominated by the teapot, still piping hot from the hearth. Ceramic mugs sat next to a wooden box filled with tea bags. She dropped into the chair opposite and began the ritual of arranging the bowls and plates. She gestured to the box. Anything look good? That peppermint you offered. Please. She gave me a sympathetic look as she placed a bag into one of the cups. You're still in pain? Yes. If anything, it's worse. I'll be all right. She handed me the mug, and I rested it in my lap. It was comforting, smelling the wafting aroma of the peppermint and lavender, feeling the heat of the water through the ceramic. I gazed out onto the grounds, watching the rain fall. I can try to answer a few of your questions, without the cryptic answers. She had gathered herself into her chair, her legs tucked up beneath her. Alma had chosen Earl Grey, and a small plate on the table beside her held a pair of finger sandwiches. She stared out towards the horizon, a pensive look on her face. She glanced in my direction. I'm afraid there are a number of things I'm not allowed to tell you. Out of respect, I'll simply tell you. No games, no obfuscation. She turned back towards the view, raising her cup to her lips. At the end of the day, you're here to make choices, Mr. Beckett. To enter the rooms, not to get answers. We'd see about that, I told myself. I took a sip of my own drink. The tea was excellent and I could feel the peppermint oil going to work on my headache almost immediately. A stray thought told me that someone close to me, someone I cared about, used to give me peppermint tea when I had a headache. A long time ago. I grimaced, pushing it away. Not important. Not now. All right. You said I'm here to enter the rooms. Why? Management brought you here. You're to make a choice. Pick a room and enter it. I can't tell you anything more than that. All right. Where am I? Todd called it Ash Manor, but the warden used another name. 
The Grey Room. I gestured with my mug at the finery around us, reaching over to pluck some dried fruit from a bowl. Strange name. The one color I haven't seen here is gray. An old name from a simpler time. I can tell you that you're not the first person that management has brought here. The rooms have changed as well. All right. Management brought me here. Why me? What makes me a good fit for this... project? She turned to look at me for a moment. The Warden, I believe, said that you're special. Who am I to argue with the Warden? You're being cryptic again. She bobbed her head back and forth, smiling. It might be harder to avoid than I thought. A hazard for my profession, I suppose. I can't tell you that. I took another drink of my tea, trying to stay calm. I could tell she was trying to be kind in her own way. But if management had brought others to the Grey Rooms before, none had been like me. I was sure of it. We don't have much time, Mr. Beckett. I'll have to take you to your door soon. Is there anything else I can clarify for you? Yes. What's stopping me from just walking out the door there? She set her mug in her lap. A frown crossed her lips. I could just walk out into the rain. I could pick a direction and leave you, and the warden, and this bizarre manner behind. I don't suppose I could just ask you not to do that? No. Well, you've walked around the manor a bit. What makes you think the grounds are any easier to navigate than the house? I'm willing to take my chances. She was silent, looking out across the grounds. Alma, all I want is to understand why I'm here. Perhaps if I did, I'd be willing to go along with this. I'm assuming... I paused. I shuddered. I'm assuming death waits behind every door. Correct? A grim fate? A dark end? She shot a look in my direction. Yes. We chose not to tell you up front. We hoped it would make the first door easier. You're right. You die every time. As feedback for the future, it did not make it easier. Wait, wait! The deaths are unpleasant, yes, I'll admit that. But look around you. Isn't this lovely? Once we get a few doors under your belt, we can start talking about longer stretches here in the manor. If you aren't willing to treat me with respect, what is any of your hospitality worth? Why should I stay a moment longer than I have to? Mr. Beckett, please sit down. Respectfully, ma'am, you can go to hell. Feeling very proud of myself, I strode towards the back door. I almost made it. Vanquish! Agra Beam! Size Rabin! As I heard the words, I felt my body seize up. She caught me mid-step, and my whole weight settled awkwardly onto my right calf. My breath caught. My chest still. I could feel my heart struggling, desperate to continue beating. I couldn't even move my eyes. My gaze was locked midway up the door. My arms stretched toward the knob. Mr. Beckett, you forget yourself. She stepped into my line of sight, ducking her head so I could see her face. The trace of a smile played about her lips. There was something about her eyes, something dark and vibrant that I hadn't seen before. Something dangerous. You're a guest here, and I'm an attendant. That means I'm here to help you, but I need you to listen to me when I give you advice. As an example, you should trust me when I say there are people here at the manor that would be much more 
demonstrative in correcting your behavior. She leaned in close and I felt her breath on my face. We're going to take a walk. I'm going to take you to your next choice of doors. When you return for your own sake, please, don't try something like this again. She straightened up and made a quick gesture with her hand. <gasps> Breath rushed back into my lungs as my chest began to move, but I still couldn't control my limbs. The pain in my legs was intense, and in my mind I screamed in agony. They began to move of their own accord. This way, Mr. Beckett. I tried to yell, to beg, but nothing came from my throat. She held the door open, and I stepped out into the rain. Moments out the door, I was soaked. My clothes clung to me like a second skin as she puppeted my stiff limbs. Alma led me away from the house, past the hedge maze and towards a small sitting area I hadn't seen from the porch. I saw it only out of the corner of my vision, as my head was still angled downwards. My arm was still outstretched reaching for a door I'd never touch. I saw the bottoms of marble benches, the sides of artistically tended bushes, and flat wide stones at the base of a well. Here you are, your second room. Your choice awaits you below. She leaned into my vision again. Somehow she was completely dry. Not a single raindrop slid down her face. I tried to back away, but my spine was painfully still. I'll see you again soon, I'm sure. I hope you won't hold this against me. She gestured, and I straightened. My head came up, and I realized I was less than two paces from the well. It was almost ten feet wide. And deep. You're a very interesting guest, Mr. Beckett. I'm sure we could have very fine conversations, if you learn to play your part. Another gesture, a flick of the wrist, and I was moving. One step, two, and I was over the wall, into the well, falling. As soon as I was over the side, I felt my muscles relax, mine to control once again. Ah! I held up my arms, tried to twist my aching body, but I hit the ground, hard. I felt the snap. The agony of my abused limbs faded in the white-hot nova of a broken leg. I looked up, hoping I would see Alma peering over the side, but all I saw was a dim circle of gray sky. Shaking, shuddering in pain, I hauled myself to my feet. I braced myself against the wall as I tried to take in my surroundings. She hadn't been lying, at least. Two doors stood on the far wall set into the stones. Both had a rusty, industrial look to them. In the dim light, I could see a flash of brass to either side. Gritting my teeth, I hopped carefully across the small space. I was in agony by the time I neared the door. One final bounding step, and I used the doorknob to steady myself. Its brass plaque read, Last Bout. I tried to turn to see the label on the other door, and almost lost my balance. A wave of pain surged through me, and I gave in. I turned the doorknob. I allowed my pain and anger to claim me. Gravity did the rest. I fell forward into the darkness of the gray room. The door swung shut behind me. The rain poured down. 
and all was silent. Chapter 3 The Old Attendant for a long moment, just trying to breathe. I was back inside the manor. <sighs> Colorful painted tiles spilled down the hallway. Uh. It was lined with doors, of course. Carpets with complex woven patterns snaked their way down the center of the corridor. I heard his footsteps first. The far end of the hall was shrouded in darkness. He stepped into the light like a wraith emerging from the great beyond. He was tall, almost impossibly so. He had on a suit, tailored and handsome, but dated. His dark hair was combed and short, like a mortician's. A long, drawn face stopped at a hard chin, and his eyes were the blue of the ocean on a stormy day. He stopped a few paces away, and I staggered to my feet. Ah, welcome back to the Grey Rooms, Mr. Beckett. I stood there for a moment, still feeling dazed. I had no idea what to say. Ahem, <clears throat> Alma asked me to apologize on her behalf. She hopes you don't think too poorly of her. That woke me up. Our tea by the fire had taken quite the turn. She did throw me down a well. <laughs> Alma is... driven. Quite brilliant. I think she feels the need to prove herself. You understand. What about you? Do you need to hurt me to prove a point? I'm long past the point of proving anything to anyone. He raised an arched, mocking eyebrow. Unless... that's something you'd like. I'm... Um, no. I'm good. All right then. If you follow me, I can show you where you can wash up. Get into some comfortable clothes. Have a meal, if you'd like. I don't. Do I have to go back into a room? He had begun to turn away. His head swung back. The look on his face seemed pained for a moment. Then it was gone. Yes, Mr. Beckett. You have to enter a room. Eventually. That is, after all, why you're here. But you can relax for a time first. Get comfortable. And we can have a chat. Alma said you were very inquisitive. He waited for my nod. When he had it, the tall man turned back down the hall and started off. I followed. Oh, sir! What's your name? He did not slow his step. Glanced back over his shoulder as he spoke. 
You can call me Bob, Mr. Beckett. Everyone else does. Bob led me through a series of hallways and doors I'd never seen before. I had the strong sense we were in a part of the manor entirely new to me. I made use of a spa room with stark white tiles and black grout to wash myself. In another, a sitting room with rows of wardrobes, he allowed me to choose some fresh clothing. The uniform I'd arrived in stunk of sweat and blood and mildew, and I was glad to be rid of it. I chose for myself a crisp white shirt with buttons and simple black slacks. From another drawer, I pulled a navy blue sweater jacket to ward off the chill of the manor. And from a chest, I procured a worn but clean pair of workman's boots. The attendant asked if I wanted something to eat, but I waved him off. What I needed was a drink. He smiled and led me on without a word. Apparently, the Grey Rooms have a bar. Over a pair of swinging saloon doors, a small sign simply said, Stone's Tavern. Inside, there was a long bar top on the right, and a couple of stools. A trio of deep booths stood along the left wall, and a jukebox already playing was tucked away in the corner. A hole in the wall that would have looked right at home in any port in the Twelve Galaxies. Make yourself comfortable, Mr. Beckett. What's your drink? Gin. A gimlet, if you've got the limes. I'll muddle my way through. Just a moment. I took a seat in the middle booth. The padding wrapped most comfortably around me and I settled my hands on the tabletop. I flexed my toes within my newly acquired boots. My eyes closed and I allowed the music on the jukebox to calm my frayed nerves. I may have even dozed off, as it seemed only a moment later I heard Bob setting down a glass. A gimlet, as requested. He'd poured one for himself as well. The citrus artfully placed on the lip of the fluted glassware. I blinked my eyes, trying to focus, and sat up in my seat. He raised his glass, and I did the same. My attendant made a face as he sipped at the concoction. You're not a gin man. I've only consumed alcohol a handful of times. I'm still learning what is to my taste. You don't strike me as a man new to the world, Bob. I am not. But my experience with mortal indulgences has been spotty over the years. Implying you yourself are not mortal. Surely you've guessed as much by now. Alma walked you across the lawn like a dog on a leash to hear her tell it. An interesting trick. How did she do it? He sipped his drink again, more appreciative this time. Alma, myself, and the other attendants of the manor are not mortal. Then, what are you? Different than yourself. And Todd, of course. Todd is like me. You are both mortal, though I wouldn't say you and Todd have much else in common. I took a deep pull of my cocktail. I could feel the alcohol going to work, and I relaxed back into the booth. Did Miss Alma tell you what prompted our walk? You tried the old 
I'll just go out the front door trick. <laughs> Everyone does it at some point, Mr. Beckett. You shouldn't think it reflects poorly on you. Though, I hope she made her point. I could feel for a moment a sympathetic pulse of pain in my leg where the break had happened. Now healed somehow by the nature of the manner. Point well made, sir. I took another sip. And you can tell her that I hold no ill will. She said that some of the others would have been more direct in correcting my behavior. I understand she was just showing me the error of my ways. He finished his drink and set the empty glass down on the table. The Grey Rooms, Ash Manor, is a special place. As I'm sure you've been told a few times now, your role on the project is crucial. I have been with the project for some time, almost as long as the Warden, and I have a great deal of experience now in ensuring our guests are well taken care of. I'm sorry I wasn't here to greet you. Unfortunately, there was an incident not all that long ago, and the repercussions for me were... unpleasant. He looked off to the side as he spoke, his eyes wandering to another booth down the line. A long moment passed. But I'm here now, and it is my fervent wish that you settle into a nice long stay with us. It's unpleasant to experience what the rooms hold, that's true. But you're very capable. He caught my eye directly. Not like other men, correct? I found myself at a loss for words, so I just nodded. He reached into his suit coat and pulled out a small notebook bound in leather. He flipped a few pages deep before using a silk ribbon as a bookmark. I have a few things to go over with you, and then you are free to ask whatever questions you'd like. Again, I nodded. Your attempt to take a walk. It's understandable. You're in an unfamiliar place. You're afraid. You want some measure of control. So, we would propose a compromise. When you emerge from a door, we'd ask that you wait for one of us to come along. But once you're situated, you can explore the manor without a guide. I raised an eyebrow. Your faith in me is touching, Bob. But I'm not sure I could even find that bathroom again if I needed it. The rooms are capricious, it's true. But for someone with a strong will, they're actually quite safe and simple to navigate. He gestured back toward the door. The room you and Alma shared tea in was called the Hearth Porch. While the manor's hallways may shift and change, the rooms are a constant amid the chaos. Picture that place in your mind and say its name. I did as he asked. I summoned an image in my mind. The wicker chairs. The kettle on the hook. The roaring fire. The hearth porch. All at once I could feel the house around me in a way I hadn't before. I could feel the creak of the bar's walls settling. I could hear the clack of the tiles in the corridor outside. I could smell the fire from the porch and I knew. I somehow knew if I walked out that door I'd be fine. I'd be able to find my way unerringly back to the cozy room where Alma had taken control of my body. Bob must have seen something pass over my face. <laughs> I see it's working. It is. How is this possible? The rooms are a precious jewel, Mr. Beckett. A dear prize which management has worked long and hard to maintain and refine and expand. This gift is just one facet of the jewel. For our purposes, in this conversation, this facet represents hope. Hope that we can trust you, 
that we can work together for some time. And, despite the strange nature of this work, that you come to trust us. I shook my head to clear it in that sense of purpose. That clean line to the hearth porch floated away. You brought me here against my will. The rooms are... (sighs) They're torture. You're torturing me. Yes, we are. A hostage is not the co-worker of his captors. We are not working together. That is how you see it today. There are many, many tomorrows ahead of us. I tip back my drink, finishing it, and set the glass back down on the table perhaps a touch too hard. I want to know why I'm here, Bob. I don't want to be your friend. (sighs) You're frustrated. I understand. I don't. But let me see if I can try. I was brought to the manor against my will and my memory was stripped clean. Correct. You won't tell me why I'm here. Or why I'm supposed to enter the rooms. You won't tell me why the Warden thinks I'm special. Indeed. Todd and I are the only mortals here. You'll let me wander the manor alone if I want, but you put some kind of magic in my head so I could do it. Excellent summation, Mr. Beckett. Well, hell, Bob. What can you tell me? He looked at me for a long, long moment. Those cool blue eyes just staring back at me. It was in the little moments like this that I could tell he wasn't human. That he wasn't a person, just a thing, pretending. I can tell you that your choices matter. That your mortality is a gift, not a weakness. He glanced down at his hands on the table and sighed before looking back up at me. (sighs) And I can tell you what your choice of rooms are. You should be able to find your way without assistance this time. I knew then that I was never going to get answers from these monsters. But his words were so interesting. My choices matter. My mortality is a gift. There was something important there. I could sense it. Any other questions? Plenty but it seems I'll have to find my own answers. You can try, I suppose, for all the good it will do you. He opened that book again, flipping through a few pages. What are my choices? We have a room upon the water, a woman on a sailing ship, or a man on a farm, adrift in a sea of wheat. Interesting imagery. Hmm. The farm. The man on the sea of wheat. Very well. Your room is a bad harvest. The door is a tall metal thing in an arch. Very recognizable. Picture it and say the name in your mind. The manor will show you the way. Ahem. Would you like another drink? No. I think I'll just sit here for a bit and then... I'll go face my death. Again. As you wish, Mr. Beckett. Bob? Yes? Are you happy? Somewhere deep in the clouds of scattered thoughts and motes of light that was my memory, something had come into focus. If the enemy refuses to give up hard intelligence, there are other types of information. Emotional reactions, for example, can tell you a lot about a person's state of mind, about their fears, their worries, their hopes and dreams. Bob's reaction to my question was pronounced. His face became like a statue's, unmoving, chiseled in stone but the expression around the mouth, the tightening 
around the eyes. Yes, Mr. Beckett. I've been with the project for many, many years. And I'm perfectly happy with the position I have. I sat back in my seat. I nodded. Well then, I'll try. If you think the project is worth it, I'll try to give it some time. Get to know you and Miss Alba. And maybe you're right. Maybe we will come to trust each other. Very well then. Do hurry along to your room in a timely fashion. If you don't, well, I'll have to come find you. Don't have to worry about me, Bob. See you soon. The man they called Bob walked from the room, and the darkness beyond the bar doors swallowed him up. I sat there for a long, long while, playing with the base of my glass, twisting it this way and that. Bob had lied to me. He'd looked me right in the eye and lied. And he was bad at it. I smiled as I stood and left the bar. I smiled as I followed that glowing line in my head to the rusty, decrepit door. And I was still smiling when I opened the door and stepped inside. Chapter 4 Calling Admiral Beckett Only one has what it takes to defend the Twelve Galaxies. Where other men would be afraid, he rises to the challenge. Only one man has the wisdom and fortitude to stand against the faithless. Those who would cast a shadow on the searing light of humanity. That man is Admiral Beckett! Last time on the thrilling adventures of the one and only Admiral Beckett. The Faithless have taken the outpost on Garzak 4. Reports indicate our forces have been completely overrun. Don't worry, Captain Lorelei. The safety of the Twelve Galaxies is in my hands. Send a message to the fleet stationed off the Kendari Nebula. Execute my secret order. Now! But, Admiral, there is no fleet stationed off the Kendari Nebula. Isn't there, Captain? Isn't there? Now sit back and tune in, as we find Beckett contemplating the vastness of space from his Admiral's suite, a brandy in his hand, and a cigar on his lips. The Faithless cannot be allowed to hold Garzak. I hope the Kandari fleet follows through. Or Captain Ramos is going to owe me a drink at the officers' club. Come. Ah, Captain Lorelei. How goes the battle? We're holding this wing with the might of the Surian alone, sir. She's a mighty warship. But the bulk of their strength is directed elsewhere. Very good. I know you have your hands full, but... Are there any updates from the other theaters of war? Not much has come over the hyperwire recently. Arestrius looks to be holding, and we've reinforced the Zagreus cloud. As long as we hold at the bottleneck, sir, 
I think we'll be all right. Very good. This campaign has been years in the making. I would hate to see it come apart so easily. It seems the battle progresses. We won't let you down, Admiral. May I return to my post? Of course. Dismissed. Oh, one more thing, sir. I think your son would like to speak with you. I saw him on my way in. <sighs> Samuel, I assume? Loitering in the hall again? Yes, sir. Please send him in. Thank you, Captain. Sir. Enter. Hey, Dad. Uh, sir. Uh, Admiral. You're a cadet now, Samuel. You should know by now. What are the rules? <sighs> when we're both off duty, I can call you Dad. I know. It just... It feels weird. Well, toughen up, lad. What did you want to talk about? Uh, I was listening to the Hyper News earlier, and... I don't understand. Didn't your fleet attack first? The report said that the fighting began in response to something that the Sovereign did. It's a complicated subject, son. I know some of the things I said last year might have confused you. But you're a young man. The news was right. The Sovereign was to blame. Removing him from power is the only choice we have. This whole war is, of course, just a response to their aggression. I know what I heard. You and Mom were sometimes shouting at each other about it. And those people coming to the house? This is a power grab, pure and simple. Isn't it? Mind your tone, boy. You have this wrong. Listen to your father. Now. Oh. Oh, I understand. I must have been wrong. You're so wise. I'm so glad we have you to look after us. Well, thank you, son. That's kind of you to say. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm here with you on your flagship. It's such an honor to serve under you. It still makes me so proud seeing you in that uniform. One day soon you'll be running your own ship, commanding your own crew. I can picture it so clearly. I know. Me too, Dad. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. What? What's going on? Nothing, Dad. I'm just so happy to be here with you today on this battlefield of triumph. Ish. No, we, f we fought. You were furious with me. I, I, I hit you. This isn't how it went at all. I know, Dad. Isn't it so much better than real life? What are you? And so that's where we'll leave it, folks. Wait, what? What's going on? Tune in again next time for the thrilling adventures of the one, the only, Admiral Beckett! One moment I was in my uniform looking down at my son. He couldn't have been more than twenty. He was beaming up at me. A smile I'm not sure I'd seen once across my long, long life. Next moment I was sitting on a couch. Back in the room with the brocade, thick carpets, and antique silver. I'd learned from Alma that this place was called the Green Lounge. Another place I could return to with the help from the tether to the manor Bob had left in my head. Hey, 
Enter. Here is, Mum. Just like I said, you be. Well done, Todd. They stood in the doorway, peering in, Todd grinning like a loon. Alma had a pensive expression on her face. Everything all right, Mr. Beckett? You've been in here for some time. I couldn't imagine what you wanted me to say, so I just opted for the truth. Yes. Yes, I'm fine. I just got caught up in a memory, it seems. Sorry again about that, sir. I don't know how your room's got away from me. Miss Alma has the names and such, though. The manor is particularly troublesome today. No one's fault. <clears throat> Are you ready to make your choice? Yes, I am. It's good to see we're making inroads. Is that trust I hear in your voice? I don't know about that. But between you and Bob, let's just say I understand my current situation more clearly. Good enough. She was clutching a sheaf of parchment held together with a thick portfolio. She flipped back and forth between a few pages before finding what she was looking for. Hmm. A sad, quiet story about a woman in a city? Or a sad, quiet story about a woman in a rural seaside village? Seems we have a theme today. The city. Oh, why why that one? If you don't mind my asking, sir. Hey. I don't know. The idea of staring out at the water, I suppose, sounds depressing. Cities are places of life, for living, that's why. And of course, for dying. Of course. Shall we, then? I made my way to the door. Alma and Todd stepped out of sight. At the hall, I turned and looked back. I could still smell the cigar smoke hanging in my quarters. I could still hear the tremor in my son's voice as he dared to stand up to me. Something told me those weren't just figments cooked up by the manor, presented strangely, so boisterously. But there was truth to them, beneath the fanfare. They'd drawn these moments out of me somehow, and were feeding them back to me twisted and distorted. Even my past, my very nature was theirs to play with. Another mystery of the gray rooms. I started down the hall, and the pair followed me. Let's get this over with. Chapter 5 Past is Prologue In spite of the warmth from the fire and the daylight streaming through the heart of the porch window, I felt chilled to the bone. My hand shook and my teacup clattered against its saucer. I quickly set it down, hoping they hadn't noticed. They had, of course. Alma and Bob sat on either side of me, teacups in hand, both calm, both poised, I was still shaking, still recovering from my time in that city by the water, still blinking the rising sun from my weary eyes. What's the dog's name? His name is Oz. A curious affectation. I don't know what he's talking about. You're adorable. 
Nein. Todd told me it gets easier on my first day. He said it would get easier as I went. Is there any truth to that? They exchanged a glance. It can, yes. But it depends on you, Mr. Beckett. On your attitude. My attitude, to be frank, is pretty lousy. But then... Can you blame me? A little. Not at all. The attendants stared at each other for a moment. Interesting. My ignorance is the source of my frustration. Separately, you've both proven to be most unhelpful. Perhaps together, you could help me to better understand my situation. Just keep in mind what we've already said, Mr. Beckett. There's some things we can't tell you no matter how many times you ask. Fair enough. What if... What if we don't talk about my situation, then? I'm sorry. Alma mentioned others had come before me. That I'm not the first person to be a guest in the rooms. Yes, that's right. Can we talk about them, then? It would be helpful to know what the other people who have been in my shoes were like. Hmm... Why would knowing about other guests be helpful? Here is their story. They arrived, chose their rooms, and died again and again and again. Eventually, they left the project. The end. You said you aren't mortal. It's things like this that make it easy to believe that's true. I believe I understand, Mr. Beckett. You're thinking perhaps you'll spot some kind of similarity between yourself and the other guests, correct? Something that might tell you more about why you're here? I can't fool you, Miss Alma. And I know you can't tell me everything, but yes, even... Even some notion of what I have in common with these other mortals might help. Might make this easier. He has been fairly reasonable so far. I suppose there's no harm in it. What would you like to know, sir? All right. Who was the first guest? Well before my time. Well, technically there were others before him. I suppose the first real guest in the rooms was a man named Raymond. Now why do you say that? His time in the rooms was the first productive venture here. What made Raymond so special? To be blunt, nothing. He just happened to be up next. His time in the rooms was our first attempt at having a guest. It was successful. Though that success was short-lived. Bob looked at me implicably with those stormy blue eyes. His face could have been carved of marble for all the warmth I saw there. You have a much easier time of it here at the manor than poor Raymond did. Good to know. Was Todd a guest in the rooms? He's the only other mortal I've met here, I believe. He was, yes. Is that why he's so odd? May I? She looked expectantly at Bob, who settled back into his chair and reached for his teacup. Please. The short answer to that question is that Todd was always a strange one, even before he entered the rooms. His eccentric nature was exacerbated by his experience. You can't tell me why either Raymond or Todd were chosen to be guests, can you? I'm afraid not. All right. Did Todd lose his hand in the rooms? Now that was a question worth asking. Alma and Bob exchanged a series of glances. I considered for the first time that they might have some method of communicating with each other I was not privy to. No, no, as you've seen yourself, the rooms don't leave any permanent scars on guests. 
He lost his hand somewhat recently. And no, I can't tell you why. I see. Mentally, I swore to find and speak with Todd the first chance I could. It would just be a matter of getting him alone, without any listening ears. Last question, Mr. Beckett. We'll need you to be making your selection soon. All right. Who was the guest in the room immediately before me? Bob's head dipped towards the floor. His implicable facade shifted ever so slightly. A woman named Samantha. Hmm. Alma, you're new to the project, right? Yes, I told you as much. So, Bob here would have been Samantha's attendant. Is that right, Bob? Yes. Why did Samantha leave the project? This isn't something we can discuss with you, Mr. Beckett. Well, it's interesting, Alma. You see, when Bob and I met, he mentioned there'd been an incident not that long ago. He said the repercussions were unpleasant. Now, if Samantha was the guest just before me, that would mean the incident was during her time on the project. Wouldn't it? I looked from one face to the other. Bob was a statue, again. Except around the eyes. Those expressive, haunted eyes. Alma glowered at me, and I could see her fingers twitching. I considered that perhaps I had overplayed my hand. I had no interest in discovering more of Alma's sorcery. You know what? I'm sorry. I've clearly touched on a sore subject here. I hope you understand where I'm coming from. There's just so much I don't know. Bob raised his head to regard me. Something had changed, something deep down. But his mask was back on. Pleasant. Calm. Apology accepted, Mr. Beckett. These are still early days for you. He leaned forward, and for the first time since meeting him, I felt a sense of menace in his gaze. Something about the way he moved reminded me of a predator. And we have many, many tomorrows ahead of us. <clears throat> Bob, do you have the, the, um, the rooms? Yes. Hmm. Ah, here we go. Here are your choices for this particular outing into Ash Manor. For the second time, I found myself walking down a hallway in the gray rooms with a smile on my face. A smile I did my best to hide. It will be a left, just there. I know, sir. You taught me well. I gestured at my head with a wave and a glance over my shoulder. The dower attendant was trailing along behind me like a wraith. I wasn't quite sure why, though I could guess. Yes, well... It's my job to ensure you make it to your door. We took the left and ascended the stairs that loomed suddenly before us. The door stood alone at the top of a small landing. There was barely enough room for the two of us to stand side by side. Off to the side, the plaque read simply, Strings. The door itself was a work of art. It was painted a weathered blue with an ornate pull handle knocker. A cheerful red candle burned in a Victorian holder affixed to the doorframe. I could see little wisps of snow blowing from under the doorway. Well, thank you for walking me all this way. You must have other things to do. I do. I just... He stared at me with those burning eyes for a long moment. 
Remember the jewel, Mr. Beckett. The many facets of Ash Manor. Management and I are hopeful that by giving you some autonomy, some leash, that you will settle in more comfortably. He leaned in, close. If he had been mortal, I would have smelled his breath. Do not make me yank that leash, sir. You will not enjoy the experience. In spite of myself, I took a step back. Do I make myself clear? I didn't trust my voice, so I simply nodded. Enjoy your room, then, if you can. He began to descend the stairs, shadows rising at the bottom to envelop him. We should talk more when you get back. I watched him until he was gone, out of sight. Gave it a ten count beyond that, and another ten count beyond that. I could remember now that in my younger days I'd had a problem with impatience. This counting game was a simple way for me to stay calm, to help me choose my moment. I glanced at the door and slipped quietly down the stairs in the attendant's wake. I'd be back. I'd walk through the door and into whatever snowy nightmare awaited beyond. But first, and finally, I had something to follow up on. Something to search for. A name. Samantha. If I could discover what had happened to Samantha, perhaps my time in the rooms would be just as much as an incident as hers. Chapter 6 The Third Floor I watched as the snake entered the Grey Rooms. I hadn't been with the project the first time this had happened, of course. But I'd read the reports. Heard the transcript from Raymond's interview afterwards. It was all so very strange. I had my suspicions. But to see it in person... A very different thing indeed. If I so chose, I could observe most everything that happened within Ash Manor. All from the comfort of my office. I was, after all, the architect. For example, just now, I saw Todd and the subject in the tavern. Laughing and joking. I could see Bob, tucked away within the ancient library above the North Wing, scribbling away in his notebook. And Alma, dear Alma, practiced diligently to perfect a ritual in the center of the hedge maze. I leaned forward at my desk, transfixed by the arrival of this interloper. It was quite the sight to see. The snake was massive, twice the size of a mortal when reared to its full height. It had three slitted eyes on either side of its head and a great scaly hood flared out behind. A thick black tongue flickered from between its jaws as it slithered from the depths of the forest on the west side of the manor grounds. It wound its way around a drain pipe on the manor's exterior wall, its full length exposed. 
I could see what looked like tentacles writhing along its length, helping it to move all the quicker. And then, with a rasp and a flick of its tail, somehow it was gone. I shuddered, and I reached for the phone. <laughs> I know. I know. <sighs> A postscript to that story. They never let us back in the bar again. But, and this is true, the captain of my flagship and that android ended up getting married. No. Not the lad with the shot glasses. They were non-binary, Todd, but yes. The two of them had a long and happy relationship. Until... Can't remember, Aizen? No. I cannot. It's... Frustrating how it comes and goes. I feel for you, sir. I do. But, uh... Uh, hey! Thanks for inviting me along to the tavern. <laughs> oh, I never really got the chance to get a drink in here last time around. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <sighs> and thank you for coming to retrieve me. Neither of the attendants were available today. They had business to get to. You know how it is. They're, they're important to the project. <laughs> Not like I told them. I'll keep the horses tended to best I can, spooky things. <laughs> oh, otherwise, I'll just never be a maintenance, you know, keeping a place up. Well... One mortal to another, I appreciate it, especially given my condition upon arrival. <laughs> the rooms are a tough pool, Mr. Becky, I understand. That last one was rough, eh? We, we, we have a needle and a friend. How did you know? Do you all watch me while I'm inside? Oh, uh, no, 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 sometimes the attendants talk over the rooms beforehand, that's all. I try not to think too much about what goes on beyond the doors. I expect they've told you I uh, used to be a guest back in my day. They did. Right. So I know, deep down, how bad it can get. Ooh. Oh, I feel for you, sir. I, I really do. Uh, but, but hey, you, you seem to be handling a lot better than other folk have. Better than me, even. <laughs> Knock on wood, you know. <laughs> well, that's kind of you to say. I'm doing the best I can. Todd. Uh, yes, sir. I don't want to offend you. I can't help but admire that handsome stone fist you have there. Was that a souvenir of your time in the rooms? Oh, no, no, sir. Pay it no mind. I did something I wasn't supposed to. Now I've got this as a bit of a reminder. Huh. That wouldn't have anything to do with Samantha, would it? <coughs> No, uh, no, no, sir, not, not Mrs. Winters, no, nothing to do with her, no, no, not at all, not at all. Todd, I do believe you're a terrible liar. Well, please, sir, I can't. If I talk about it, they'll know. And I'll have an even rougher time of it than the last one. You've been in the rooms, Todd. You know how bad it is. You know how badly I want to understand why I'm here. You know how badly I want to escape. I do, sir. I really do. I'm, I'm sorry. Tell me something, man. Anything. I, I can't, sir. I really can't. You'll hurt me again. Who? Alma? No. No, sir. The, the architect. The architect. She's part of management, sir. Terribly powerful. And very unforgiving. High standards, you know. 
She was the one what did this to me. Uh, for the things I can't talk about. No. No, I understand. It must have been a terrible ordeal. It was, sir. Please don't ask me again. I won't. Have another drink, Todd. Thank you, sir. Oh, I suppose then I... I'd better help you get to your room, eh? Uh, don't want them to come and find us drinking up the stock and carry it on. I suppose so. Now, uh, Bob, right down from here. Let's see. We've got uh, a quiet night at a museum is interrupted by an ancient curse. Ooh, that sounds nice. Or, uh, the circus has come to town and a sad clown. Uh, you know what? I say, go with the museum. Uh, I've seen what some of these clown rooms are like and, and they're just the worst. I think. I think I choose the third door. The. the third door, sir? I hung up the phone. The other interested parties had been alerted. Inquiries had been made. And one way or another, we would find the serpent. I was just in time to watch as the subject stood from his bar stool and led Todd from that dingy watering hole. I made a note for myself to have Stone's Tavern removed from the manor. He seemed too at ease in that place, too content. A balance had to be struck. I continued watching as the subject led the sputtering groundskeeper down one hallway after another. Despite Todd's protestations, Beckett seemed to walk with purpose, with drive. My bemusement turned to something else. I realized I could see the snake again. It was in a crawl space above the southwestern gallery, keeping pace with the two of them. It moved slowly, unhurriedly. That was the moment when the subject turned the corner on a hallway that had not been there just a moment before. My mouth opened wide in surprise. I leaned forward as Beckett came to a stop before an oak door with a tarnished brass plaque. It read, The Ride, in a flowing, preposterous script. Every door in the Grey Rooms bears a name, and I am the one that writes the name on every single door. Except this one. This was not my door. And it was, of course, the one he pulled open. Bob? Ma'am? Explain. Now. I cannot. Todd has repeatedly and vociferously explained that he offered Mr. Beckett the two agreed-upon rooms. The museum and the circus. Yes. Todd says that Beckett considered for a moment before choosing the third door. There is no third door. There has never been a third door. Yes, ma'am. Did you find the serpent? No, ma'am. We looked. I even sent Todd out wandering by himself in hopes the creature would attempt to consume him. However it entered the manor grounds, it appears to have left the same way. I don't understand. On a number of levels. To start with, why would he not want to choose the circus room? It is a quandary, ma'am. No matter. 
Retrieve Alma from the hedge maze. Ask Todd to gather the hounds from the kennels. Unleash the warden if you have to. But continue the search. Yes, ma'am. I must report this to the others. This could represent a substantial change in the project's stability. None of the loci were calculated to support intrusion from... elsewhere. And back it. Bring Todd along when you go to collect the subject. I believe they may have established some kind of rapport. Indeed. Sit Beckett down. Look into his eyes and ask him where this third door came from. It will be done. And Bob? Yes, ma'am. Don't hold back. Not like the last one. Am I clear? Crystal, ma'am. Admiral Beckett will answer your questions. Or he will find there are things far, far worse than death in the Grey Rooms. Chapter 7 Worse Than Death seemed somehow appropriate to bring him to the stables. The horses had carried him here in the first place, after all. This might very well be the place where he... exits. There you are, sir. Mr. Beckett's tied up nice and tight. <laughs> or won't be going anywhere. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. The supplies are in the shed out by the reflecting pool. Gather them, if you please. Oh, yes, sir. Todd, for all his faults, was smarter than he let on. He tried to hide it most days, but there was concern and cunning in his eyes as he looked down at the man in the chair. Do, do we really need to do this? Is this unnecessary? Um, I'm afraid it is. The architect was quite specific. You never, you never will... Oh, he's not going to want to go along with the project now, is he? If we work him over like this... I looked away, unable to meet his gaze. <sighs> Perhaps I can convince him to talk. Perhaps this is all just a simple misunderstanding. And if you can't... You're really going to... Go. I'll awaken our guest. I'll be right back, sir. <laughs> the Admiral's head hung forward, still not fully recovered from his last room. Whatever he had experienced, it had been quite the ordeal. Management was looking into our returns to try to get a sense of where he might have gone. But in the meantime, in the meantime, it was my job to take a more direct approach. <coughs> what? Where am I? Bob! What the hell? Stay calm. Admiral, for your sake, as much as mine. What is this? Untie me! I'm afraid that's not possible at the moment. Something unpleasant has occurred. 
We need to discuss your last entry into the rooms. Why? What happened? I really do need you to calm yourself. We are being observed, and I'm afraid I have very specific instructions as to what needs to happen here. Respectfully? Fuck you, Bob! I understand that this is most distressing. But remember your tea with Alma. You want to talk to me. There is an option much more demonstrative waiting in the wings. All your talk of cooperation, of working together, the friendly chats at the bar go out the window the instant it no longer suits you. I'll take that as acceptance. Thank you. Now then, what do you remember? Todd and I were having a drink at the tavern. I chose a room, and then he walked with me until I stepped inside. Do you remember which room you chose? I... I... No. I don't. I remember stepping through the door. I... I remember... I was in a vehicle. I... I remember... Teeth. And then... That's it. If I remembered more, I'd tell you. Did you do something to my memory? I stared hard at his face. Despite dealing with mortals for as long as I have, I admit, I still found it difficult to process what they're thinking, to intuit what they are feeling. Behind his eyes, what was that loathsome, squishy intellect planning? All I saw on the surface was fear and confusion. Did you mess with my head again, Bob? No. To my knowledge, no one on staff has manipulated your memory. <sighs> that is not a good thing, because clearly your memory has been compromised. So it wasn't you. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. Place the bag there on the table. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Let's go back. You and Todd here were having a drink at the tavern. What did you have? A shot of whiskey. Just something to calm the nerves. Then he offered you a choice of rooms. Do you remember what they were? One was... A museum, remember? Uh, and the other one was a circus with a clown. <laughs> Todd. Ah, sorry, yeah. Yes. Yes, I remember. The museum was cursed. And Todd said not to take the circus room, so I chose. Uh, Go on. Which room did you choose? I didn't. I chose the third room. I didn't! Sir, respectfully, I, I didn't offer you no third room. There ain't never been a third room. I... I heard it. There was a voice. It said that, th that there was a third choice. The third door. A lonely night on the open road, it said. You'll like this one, it said. Fascinating. Mr. Becky, I was standing right there. I, I didn't hear anything like that. It was. It was in my head, buzzing along my jaw. It made my molars hum. And then, just like you showed me, it led me right to the door. Wait. Like I showed you. Yes. That sense of purpose. The clean line that connected me with the manor. It was exactly the same. I sat back in my chair, considering his words. It made a certain kind of terrible sense, what he was saying. It explained a great deal, actually. But at the same time... We'll see that now, Mr. Beck. It's not about to do anything wrong. 
He's just got told the wrong thing. <laughs> he got through the bat, it says. A lot of room to tricky that way. You know how they are. So, well, why, why don't we just untie him? We can all have a stretch to get him sorted before he has to pick another door. Uh, we can't do that, I'm sorry to say. Go and get him. He'll be waiting for you in the dining room. Uh, no. Please. Todd. I know you have troubles with us mortals sometimes, but you can see it all over his face. He's telling the truth. He ain't lying to you, Bob. It does not matter anymore. Go. Now. <laughs> this is wrong, sir. Just wrong. I'm sorry, Mr. Becky. <laughs> What's happening? Where is he going? Don't worry about that for now. For now, we need to take care of a bit of business. Your doors. I'm tied to a chair. You're threatening me and you want me to pick my door. As I told you, your choices are important. And so I need you to choose. Ahem. I have for you two rooms this evening. One is... Ah, interesting. The first is a mining expedition. A survey mission in the depths of space should be quite comfortable for you, I imagine. It's the little things. The other is a tale of a small guardian defending their charge on a particularly dangerous battlefield called I Loved My Human. I'm not choosing anything until you tell me what's going on! Admiral. David. Please. Why should I ever trust another word out of your mouth? You fucking demon. His words rung within me like a bell. You fucking demon. I bent my head. How many of these mewling, short-lived creatures had thrown that word at me? How many had cursed my very name? I looked back up into his face. He was furious. A wall. Soon, Todd would return, and Beckett would be lost. I would have lost two of them. So soon, one after the other. I raised my head to regard the ceiling, thinking of the eyes greedily watching us, listening to every word we said. And so, for the first time in a long while, I was the one that made a choice. Aldria, Aldrush, Thanakai. Here you are, sir. Thank you, Todd. Ah. <laughs> Run along now. Well, well, well. What have we here, Bob? I expect you'll be the one to tell me. Did Todd fill you in on our revelation? He did? Oh, he very much did. What a fascinating development. It's worth noting that I believe Mr. Beckett is telling the truth. I... I am, Warden. This really isn't necessary. It doesn't matter, does it? No, it does not. However, as a show of good faith, our guest has chosen a room. He understands how important his choices are. Oh, good. What 
doorway should I toss his bleeding carcass through? It's the little things, asshole. <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> ah. I'll leave you to it then, Warden. Very good. Oh, and Bob? Yes. She wants to see you right away. She's waiting in her office. Of course. Admiral, we'll speak again soon. You can count on it. No. Stop, I I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> Chapter 8 A dog is just a dog Another return to the gray rooms. Another rainy evening on the hearth porch. <sighs> Another cup of tea. I sat looking out at the grounds in one of those wicker chairs. The rain poured down, a curtain of white noise. And it was all I could do to keep my head upright. My torturous experience at the hands of the Warden, combined with my death aboard the Luminosity. It was all so draining. I absently reached down to pet Alma's dog. Oz, I think she called it. In the corner, the attendants poured our drinks and gathered our meal. I think he likes you. Bob looked over, still seemingly amused by the creature's presence. Hmm. He's a good boy, Bob. Huh. I just realized. Is this even actually a dog? Do you want the long answer or the short answer? I would prefer an answer that I can understand, if you please. Short then. Sometimes a dog is just a dog, Mr. Beckett. Well said. Would you like some tea, Admiral? Are you going to tie me to my chair first? No, I will not. Something with caffeine. I can't remember a time I was this exhausted. That's true of so many things, though. We may be able to help you with that. I know this last span of time was challenging for you. The experience aboard the ship was a particularly vivid nightmare, Miss Alma. Did you know that was how my father died? He was aboard a shuttlecraft when it was damaged, leaving a planet's atmosphere. Solar flares in the region kept the rescue party from reaching him in time. Bob set my tea down in front of me, his face a mask of stone. Alma's face was drawn, but her eyes were vivid and alive with an unpleasant way. Something told me both of them already knew what I was going to say, and I pressed on. As I spoke, I slid my hand over the dog's fur, 
There was comfort in the simple, tactile reassurance of man's best friend. He had enough time to record a vid for us. A goodbye. We think he intended to turn off the recorder before the air ran out, but it took him by surprise. I looked away from the attendants and out across the ground. The hedge maze was gone today, and a large reflecting pool dominated our gloomy view. A flock of tall, stork-legged birds were hunting fish in the shallow water. They were a striking lavender color, and for a moment I watched their rhythmic bobbing motions. She shut it off before I saw the end, but that night I snuck down to my mother's office. I can still remember every detail. The floorboards were so cold under my feet. The feel of the knob in my hand as I carefully turned it. I found the key she'd hidden, unlocked the desk drawer, activated the hand display and loaded up the file. I turned back to look directly at Bob, who returned my stare implicably. At the age of 11, I watched my father die of hypoxia, choking and gasping, desperately trying to tell his loved ones not to watch. Just yesterday, you tortured me for hours. My blood soaked the straw in the stables, and then you sent me off to die the exact same way as my father. I was the one who had to look away. The thing in the suit before me wasn't going to blink. And because of what you've done to me, what the rooms have done to me, I can't remember his name. A glance at Alma showed me that she was just as unmoved as Bob. Her eyes were pools of emotion, but it wasn't sympathy or kindness. I can remember every detail of his death, but not his name. That is what it means to be a prisoner inside the Grey Rooms. <clears throat> you have my sympathies, Admiral. Neither Alma nor I choose the experiences that are put in front of you. I assume you know that by now. Is that the job for the architect? What? How? Where did you hear that name? <sighs> the same way the guests learn everything in the Grey Rooms, Miss Alma. Todd. Am I right? Or am I wrong? Who chooses the rooms is not important. What is important is... I raised a hand, pointing an accusatory finger at his chest. It is important. You think you're so superior to us mere mortals, but every action you take gives away your design. The choice to select that horror show, that doomed mission, it tells me that these rooms are not random. This is no arbitrary process. You pick the rooms in some way to fit the guests, don't you? Some aspect of my history or my personality. Every room you select somehow connects back to me. I turned to Alma, whose face had yet to move. You agreed with the warden the first day we met. Said I was special somehow. That wasn't just some empty flattery, was it? There's something about me in particular that you need. You need Admiral David Beckett, hero to the Twelve Galaxies. Why? Mr. Beckett, David, we can't answer that question sitting here today. But you're right, you've been through a great deal. I'd like to propose we speak to management on your behalf, to the architect. Perhaps we may be able to answer your questions more directly. In the meantime, we have come to the hearth porch today with more than just tea. We have an olive branch of sorts. As Alma noted, management recognizes the ordeal you've been through. The timing of it's the little things. I can't speak to management's intent, but on the heels of a conversation with the warden, well, it would be a great deal for anyone to bear. Even a man such as yourself. 
And, as I told you before, I wish that we could tell you why the third door is so concerning. But, as with so many things, we cannot. I searched his face, looking for a tell, anything that might tip Alma he was lying. I saw it. There. Something in the way he'd set his mouth. But I felt certain she wouldn't. Wouldn't see how the man was covering his tracks, or even hinting at our conversation. So, as we've said all along, we want you to be comfortable when you're here. After this next room, after this next choice, we're to allow you an extended respite at the manor. What does that mean? You have admirably worked your way through several rooms and dealt with some unpleasant experiences. When you return, you'll be able to stay at the manor, not make your next choice for quite some time. Months, perhaps. It depends. Management has certain expectations, and we need to make sure we balance this effort with their needs. Perish the thought of disappointing management. I patted the pup's back and stood, <laughs> wincing. Everything still hurt. I strode to the windows, looking past my own reflection to the gray sky beyond. We will have to keep in touch during your stay, more so than before. As a precaution against another intrusion, we've removed the piece of the manor we placed inside of your head. I thought something felt different. But beyond that, you'll have run of the grounds. You may relax as you wish, until the needs of the project dictate your time in the rooms must resume. More of this pretense of partnership. My captors seemed to believe that by offering me platitudes and tea, I would one day forget I was a prisoner. Forget that I was being tortured. Other men may have given in, but I was not like other men. I turned away from the window to look down on the attendants. For the first time I saw that in the shadows of the hearth porch, their eyes glowed silently. A reflection of the inhumanity within. I appreciate the effort you're going to. I really do, Bob. Alma. I'd like to ask two. Favors isn't even the right word. I'd like to ask for two considerations. If it pleases management. I'd be happy to pass along anything, Mr. Beckett. What would make this easier for you? First, I... I'd like to see my family again. However that happened before, I'd like a chance to see them again. I looked down, unable to look them in the eye as I spoke. Please, do what you did last time. I won't fight it. Allow me to remember my past the way I wish it had been, instead of how it really was. I think we might be able to arrange that. What else? I raised my eyes to meet Bob's gaze, matching his unwavering resolve. I want to help figure this out. You said you wanted us to work together. Give me work to do. I stepped away from the windows, gesturing for emphasis. Something happened to me. Somehow I was able to find a third door. As I hope you now understand, we were telling the truth. Neither Todd nor I know how it happened, but it still happened. So let me aid you. In whatever small way, let me help to solve this mystery. Perhaps a challenge, or a reason to be here might help make my time at the manor pass more quickly. I tried not to smile when my attendant, my jailer, finally looked away. Bob looked off toward the fire in the corner of the room a pensive expression on his face. Alma seemed not to notice. An intriguing idea. And one with merit. If nothing else, I'm sure management will appreciate the offer. That was my hope as well. Bob swung his head back around, some obvious irritation showing in his eyes. Good, then. We're all in accord. Unless you'd like some more tea, Admiral. I think it's best you choose your room now. While you're inside, we can speak to management on your behalf and prepare for your extended stay. I nodded. Even this was a small victory. 
Perhaps my first real victory since arriving at Ash Manor. Very good, then. Alma. She reached the side table, pausing to scratch Oz behind the ears, and pulled a notebook into her lap. Let's see. That's, no. That's an arcane formula I'm working on. Some claudication magic, a recipe for a Zabalberry tort Todd recommended. Ah, here we go. Both of your rooms are family tragedies, I'm afraid. One sees a man desperately wishing he could save his wife from her inner demons. That room is called Take It Easy on My Heart. The other is the tale of a mother struggling to understand dark changes within her sweet, beloved son. That room is simply called Nolan. And you feign surprise at my suggestion the rooms connect to me somehow. Neither attendant moved or blinked. It was as if I was being guarded by a pair of statues. Nolan, I think. Sounds as if it's going to be an easier journey. If nothing else, it touches on subject matter I'm intimately familiar with. Very good. Both of them stood, and Oz clambered to his feet to stand at his mistress's side. If you'll follow Oz and I, we can show you the way. The dog waited for me, and I absently reached down to pat him before heading towards the door. I turned back to look at Bob, who I thought would be gazing after us. He wasn't. Instead, as I slipped out the door and into the twisting corridors of the manor, the attendant was doing as I'd done, staring out into the falling rain, considering his future. And despite his best efforts, despite his inhuman calm, looking for all the world as if something was terribly, terribly wrong. Chapter 9 Respite Respite Part 1 Alma I stood in the center of the ballroom, gazing idly up at the impressive chandelier hanging above me. It reflected the illumination from the hundreds of candles scattered about the room. A thousand notes of light bounced across the high walls of the chamber. These reveries were not uncommon for me. Others had told me my long years with the Alienist Lodge had left me with numerous quirks. I chose to see them as differentiators elements that set me apart from the endless ranks of Hell's army. Oz, as always, was the one to help me focus, to remind me of what was important here and now. I sighed and looked down at the blood-slick floor, my focus for these last long hours. Todd had ferried the sanguine vessels down to the rooms for me as a favor. It had taken painstaking work to create the mystic sigils, delicate circles, and arcane equations I'd developed for this process. And now, finally, I was ready to test my theory. I reached out my hand and Oz came to stand at my side. His ears were up and his eyes were on me. If I were to assign myself a place in the pantheon of infernal sorcerers, I would by necessity have to place myself somewhat low in ranking. I did not possess the natural ability that sometimes came by familial birthright. I did not have the extensive tutelage I would have received if I were in a clan with notorious spellcrafters or prodigious wealth. And at my tender age, I certainly did not have the excess and experience a figure like the architect could put towards their will-working endeavors. What I did have, and I smiled as I reached down to pat Oz fondly on the head, was quite possibly the most powerful and devoted familiar a sorceress could ask for. Check my work for me, boy. Mm. 
Dutifully, Oz patted around the great circular ritual space I'd created. He checked each sigil, each rune, every blood-soaked line and channel of power. On the far side, he looked up at me, doggy impatience on his face. Ah, good catch. Thank you, sir. Where he indicated I transposed two elements that could have destabilized my entire lattice. A journeyman mistake. I raised my hand and with a gesture wiped away the bloody runes. I gave my fingers an upward sweep and the bloody flecks sizzled with fire as I smote them from existence. I reached with my spectral hand for the paintbrush and pot on a nearby table. As they floated across the room, I heated the blood in the pot to ensure it would flow just as if it was fresh from an artery. A few delicate strokes with the paintbrush and the transposed runes were set to rights. Oz gave the newly drawn symbols a brief glance and then continued his circumnavigation of the ritual space. By the time he returned to my side, I'd set down my implements. I smiled down at him. Good boy. I raised my hands and I felt my power rise. I gestured curtly and the music came to a stop. The universe leaned down to listen. This was what drew me to magic in the first place when all was said and done. In the grand scheme of things, I was so small, so insignificant. But through the arcane, even the humblest of beings could reshape reality, move mountains, even divert rivers. Rustrix. Long closed are the doors between realms. Abla Natalba. Now, at my command, I bid you open wide. Says Rabim at Terastria. Let the river flow once again. Potestate Ardraniala! Respite Part 2 The Warden I stood in the doorway to the manor, looking out into the night. Murder. Chains. Blood. I had the door open so I could smell the fresh air and feel the rain on my face. It puddled on the ground in the foyer. Large streaks that would take Todd hours to clean and dry. I didn't care. Wiggling. 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 Warm. Right. Right. <laughs> the architect may have built this version. May have designed it, but the rooms are still mine, 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 and so I could tell, I could feel it somewhere deep, deep inside, change was coming, change, 
Chains, chains. Chop, chop, chop. <laughs> They kept trying to, to tame me, to put me back in my bottle. <laughs> but you can't unring a bell. You can't unmake a piece of art. Once the art is made, it's real. It's really, really real. And there's nothing you can do. You just have to kneel there as the water soaks you to the bone. The gravel of the drive digging into your flesh. I'm alive. Still in the kiss taught me from being alive. Once they tried, but it didn't take. You can't take it from me. Can you now, James? <laughs> <laughs> They'd managed to get the chains off of me with knives and fire and screaming. They'd had to pin me to a wall. Couldn't use chains to hold me there because, well... <laughs> so many fucking knives. Oh, I loved it. But they also come back. And as I looked up into the night sky, I could feel them all as one thing. Change. Change. Chains. Chains. Coming at me. They're coming. Coming. Hurtling coming. out of the dark. Coming from the dark. Coming to the gray rooms. <laughs> Respite Part 3 Todd I swear I'd have sworn up and down on my old dear clan matron that this was it. This was where the room was supposed to be. I'm in the South Hall, see, and I had in my hand, in that nice script Miss Homer used, the name of the room I had to. Bugger me! I swear sometimes the rooms do this to me on purpose, you know? They know, other than the guest, I'm about the only mortal that comes and goes round here. Not that one. Miss Armour explained it all simple like. Todd, she says, we need you to do this for the project. We need Mr. Beckett. And I interrupt her at this point, not trying to be rude and say, I'm oh, begging your pardon, Miss, but isn't he an admiral? Well, I think that might have upset her a little bit because she was trying to make a point. <laughs> uh, anywho, she says, you've got to go take this room for Admiral Beckett uh, because he's resting on account of the warding slicing him up so bad you could see his insides or on his outsides. Oh, I might be paraphrasing just a bit. <laughs> me, 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 me. So here I am, puttering around, looking for, um, uh, things you see in a graveyard. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's likely to be all full of dead things, isn't it? Clawing at my face, isn't it? Oh, yeah. uh, meanwhile, the Admiral is getting a set upon his set upon. Right, having a rest and dreaming about his families and daring space adventures. Oh, well, when I was in here, I never bubbled with any of that. 
You know, using your memories like weapons against you in a bid to undermine your psyche and craft you into the perfect vessel for his schemes. <laughs> All that nonsense. As I dug the knife into his leg. There? You know, this here has two times in just a short while having to go into the rooms. It's more than a fella can handle these. I'm supposed to be retired. <laughs> it certainly would help if this spooky old house would stop hiding the damn room from me. Ooh. Oh, it's not that one either. <laughs> no, best be moving along. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to have to... Oh, 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 hang on a minute. Well, here it is. Ha, <laughs> plain as day. Must have shoveled things around on me again. What nasty grave your door is, one is. All foggy and misty beyond. <laughs> right. No sense putting it off, Todd, old boy. Just another time in the rooms. Just like, like, riding a bike. Ha <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. All oh, right, okay. Oh, I just like riding a bike, covered in spikes and fire. Okay, here we go. Oh, oh and I ate this pot. Respite Part Four. Bob. It is the 27th day of the month of Jormungandr. The waning moon sets as I pen this entry. I've returned once again to this small library, my study, as I think of it, above the North Wing. As far as I'm aware, I am the only being to have entered this room since Ash Manor was constructed. The architect knows of its existence, as she knows of every nook and cranny in this sprawling heap. She most assuredly does not know the contents of these journals. I know this with some certainty. If she did, I would be attempting to pen missives in my blood and entrails as a large wolf ripped at my very soul. Hmm. Perhaps it would be a bird. She seems quite fond of them. Unfortunately, I have little to add to my body of knowledge. So I will attempt to use this precious time by myself to sum up what I know. With each iteration of the rooms, it seems the architect tweaks and changes the substrate in subtle but important ways. Management has claimed again and again that these changes are signs of success, that the fruitful nature of the project has allowed for improvements, upgrades, and the addition of supplementary staff. This is true, to an extent, but... A passing thought. New faces enter. Jailers, builders, who are they? Supplementary. <clears throat> the truth of the matter is that the runes change without form or meaning. I'm beginning to wonder who truly designed this iteration, the architect or her creation itself. These changes may in part be a result of the guest in question. Beckett has proven to be formidable, even dangerous. I feel certain that I've hidden his extracurricular wanderings from the operations staff. But at some point, he's going to push to know more. And after our brief conversation in the barn, his curiosity must be razor sharp. Once he's on his feet again, 
once this respite is ended, we'll have to have another talk. And I'm running out of ways to say I can't tell you that. I find myself confused, frustrated, perplexed at my current situation. And despite everything that transpired between us, I dearly wish that Miss Winters was around to ask her opinion, if nothing else. If nothing else, I could ask her about these changes in me. What she could have done in that brief moment to tilt me on my axis so thoroughly. Wherever she is, I hope she is not suffering excessively. She was a remarkable mortal, as is this Beckett, of course. Perhaps there's something of her in him. Perhaps if I reach out again in the right way, in the right moment, I might be able to reach him. And at last, find new purpose. Find a spark of what I once had, and restore my faith in the project. A closing thought. We stood on the wall. She tumbled beyond my sight. Why am I still here? Chapter 10 The Cloak of Keys Only one has what it takes to defend the Twelve Galaxies. Where other men would be afraid, he rises to the challenge. Only one man has the wisdom and fortitude to stand against the Faithless. Those who would cast a shadow on the searing light of humanity. That man is Admiral Beckett! Last time on the thrilling adventures of the one and only Admiral Beckett. <laughs> You've done it again, Admiral. Now, now, Samuel. Don't give your father too much credit. It'll go straight to his head. <laughs> Amanda, I'm in the middle of saving the 12 galaxies from a terrible threat. I can do all that and still make it home in time to make a delicious meal for my family. That's worth celebrating. <sighs> Dear, you threw some meat and beans in a pot and let it sit for a few hours? That's hardly galaxy-shaking stuff. I thought you liked my chili. <laughs> I did not marry you for your cooking, Admiral. What did you marry me for, then? And that's my cue to go. Thanks again for dinner, Dad. I'll see you at the starport tomorrow morning. Of course. See you tomorrow, son. Now sit back and tune in as we find the Admiral seated aboard a transport ship. His youngest son is at the helm. His darling wife is at his side, but something has him preoccupied. With a roar of engines, the small ship breaks free of planetary atmosphere. Our hero stares thoughtfully at a porthole. 
into the vastness of space. Orbital Control, this is the transport ship Mudan. Do we have clearance to pull away? Roger that. Assuming Vector 289 on an outbound course, we'll send notice when we make it to the hyperlane marker. Mudan out. That was well done, son. <sighs> Mom, I've done this a hundred times before. Yes, but I haven't seen it the other hundred times now, have I? I so rarely get off planet these days. And with my family, no less. How is the Planetary Administration going to survive without the President for a whole week? They'll just have to try. I've seen about a dozen messages come through already. I'm studiously ignoring them. <laughs> Until we get to the fleet tomorrow? Well, yes. I have this entire trip alone with my husband and son. I'm going to enjoy it. Business be damned. Are you going to get to enjoy the trip, Dad? Dad? <laughs> you with us? David? Oh! Oh. Here. I'm sorry. I got lost in my own thoughts. Was it politics or tactics? Or both? Uh, neither, I'm afraid. Something a little more somber. I'm not looking forward to leaving you. Leaving us? I don't... I'm sorry. I'm not making much sense. Don't mind me. What were we talking about? Whether or not you'll be able to enjoy this trip. I suppose that question is already answered, though. What's on your mind? I don't want to... David, we are your family. Let us help you. I could never get past when you set your jaw like this. All right. Just like we used to. I've got a problem that needs solving. Are we up to it? Oh, wow. We haven't done this in years. When was the last time? The lake house on that little moon? No, William wasn't there for that. It had to have been when all five of us were together for Aldrich's commendation ceremony. Ten years? Then we're overdue. Are we up to it? <laughs> let's do it. All right. Let's say... Uh, let's say one of my men has been taken prisoner. Is it the Faithless? A new enemy. They're strange. Ruthless in their own way, but with a sense of decorum. They'll sit you down for a tea one day and strap you to a chair for enhanced interrogation the next. So, well-versed in psychological warfare? Extremely. A man is being held captive in a strange facility. He has some limited capacity to explore, but he's under surveillance. Extraction is out of the question? Yes. Even the true location of the facility is unknown. What would you suggest be his next course of action? Sam? Hmm, I... I don't know, this is a little out of my depth. There are no captains here. Just family. Say what you're thinking. Well, I'm going to guess that the by-the-book answer would be for him to stay calm, keep his mouth shut, and hope for extraction. Try to slip out intel that tells us where he is. That's right. But that's not going to happen, is it? I can see it on your face. He's on his own. Yes. If I were him, I'd do everything I could to make sure I wasn't on my own. Someone somewhere in that facility has to be... I don't know a potential ally. Someone who's unsatisfied. Someone who's been slighted with leadership, maybe? A man on his own has no time to sleep. That's why you go to war with your brothers. Hmm. That sounds familiar. I think a very wise man may have said that to you once upon a time. <laughs> you still put your pants on one leg at a time, dear. Don't get a big head. Yes, dear. <laughs> oh, Dad. On the comms. It's for you. Is it Captain Lorelei? No. You should answer, Dad. 
It's important. Um... All right, give it here, then. Uh, hello? Admiral, it's Alma. We must end the ritual keeping the illusion alive. Your respite has concluded. What? No! It's, it's been... It hasn't been that long. We told you that there was a limited amount of time we could make available to you. I wish it could be longer. I'm sorry. No. Please. Samuel, Amanda, please stay with me. I'm sorry, Dad. It's time to go, David. And so that's where we'll leave it. No. Please don't take them away. Tune in again next time for the thrilling adventures of the one, the only, Admiral Beckett. Sometime later, when the shaking and the sobbing had stopped, Alma brought me to the parlor off the foyer. I glanced into this room back on my very first day at Ash Manor. Today, the room was very different. The warden sat in state in the middle of the space, atop a great rune-carved chair. Like royalty atop a throne, he loomed over me. The warden. Chained. Gone was even the semblance of civility. Like a sanitarium dweller shrugging free a straitjacket, the great black coat was gone. In its place, he wore a cloak of keys. The cloak was made of long lengths of tangled chain which fell from his shoulders and down to the floor. The keys were strong along the links, each one different than the last. As I swept my eyes along that cloak, I knew, somehow, that each link, each key matched up to a door somewhere in the manor. Or the Grey Rooms, as Samantha Winters had known. The rooms Todd had entered, or even that poor wretch Raymond. There were hundreds, perhaps thousands, of keys. From beneath his wild hair, his burning eyes stared, and a hideous rictus was etched across his face. He's back. <laughs> uh, Warden? Alma, what's going on? Management has decided to make a change in how we've been doing things. We're going to have ever so much fun. I'm not sure I understand. Because of the unexplained nature of the incident not too long ago, the Warden has been asked to more actively patrol the grounds. Get to play with you, too. He will also be assisting us in attending you from time to time. Better play nice, Admiral. Or something real bad might happen. I knew looking from Alma's face to the Wardens that this was not something she was happy about. But that gleam in the madman's eye meant now was not the time to ask questions. <laughs> and then, all at once, like an avalanche, it all came crashing down around me. My exhaustion, my fear, my despair, it was all too much. I felt an irrational desire to grab a weapon. To make a break for freedom, damn the danger. My eyes darted around the room, and I saw massive brass lamps sitting on the corner table. If I timed it right, it was sure. Dad. The voice stopped me cold. Somehow the warden, Alma, even the manor, all seemed far away. Don't. 
Stay calm. Standing beside the warden's right shoulder, looking exactly as he had in Alma's illusion, stood my son. His eyes were locked on mine, sadness swimming in their depth. What is this? All at once, the world began moving again. Both of my captors stared at me, and I realized I must have spoken out loud. Admiral, I I know this is unpleasant, but I'd advise you to be calm. Yeah, or I'll stake you down and peel that face of yours clean off. <laughs> they can't see me or hear me. I followed you here, from that other place. A man on his own has no time to sleep, remember? He smiled, and for the first time in a long time, I felt the tension in my chest ease. Well, now you're not alone. I turned towards the warden and forced myself to offer up a smile as broad as my son's. Whatever happened next, I wasn't alone. Not anymore. Thus concludes part one of the logs of Admiral Beckett. We would like to take this time to thank our patrons once again. And to any of you who have taken the time to leave us a five-star rating and a review. Those reviews keep us at the top of the charts and makes it easier for more twisted souls to find the show. Patrons like Aaron Anthony, Amy Nikolai, Arthur Unk, Diverelli, Ellie Dowell, Ellen Houghton, Emily Cullen, Jackalbot Snows, Ronan Kumori, Jason Porras, Jeremiah Overstreet, Jessica Finch, Karina Sonina, Kay Davis, Kelly Bear, Klaus H., Kyle Wilcox, Laura Lupinetti, Lynn Browning, Lizzie B., Mesa, Megan Pruitt, Michael Velez, Mike Devine, Mitch Garretts, Michael Philip BG, Paige Pye, Patrick Stewart, Plin Plin Plon all night long, Sean Gary, Shay Barbie, Sparky Anglin, Spirit Live, Stacy Thewis, Sybil McKinney, Talicia Gallman, The Original Nick Show, Molly Riefler, and Bruce Bollet. Thank you ever so much for your support. Without you, this really would not have been able to happen. Season 3 was a lot to do with you. And The Grey Rooms is also streaming for free on Spotify. Just get the Spotify app or open the browser and search The Grey Rooms. And we here at The Grey Rooms love our fans, of course. And we always want to try to get back to you in the best way we know how. And we have a lot of fun things to show you in the upcoming weeks. And we hope that you like them. You can find out more by joining us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and YouTube. And we took your advice and extended an olive branch to all of the tortured souls who have passed through the rooms. Our emotional support group is always looking to help you with all of your um, your needs. And don't forget about our merch store. It's full of epic designs and logos for you to sport, showing the world you are a survivor of these very rooms. All of this can be found in the show notes or on our website at thegrayrooms.com. And then you want to join in on the fun over at our Discord channel. Yep, join today. Meet Bob, meet the warden, rub noses and hobnob with patrons, authors, and actors alike. The community is growing and the community is wonderful. So join us over in Discord today. Trust me, you're missing out if you're not there. And once again, thank you ever so much for joining us. We have part two coming next week. So we're going to get back to work on that because right after that is the finale of season three. What a season it's been. So anyways, a lot to do. Thanks ever so much. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>